<laughs> All right, it looks like people are coming in, Commissioner. Oh, Lord. So let's give them about, sometimes it takes about 30 seconds to get everybody in the room, so. Okay. We'll wait uh, till everybody's in, or it looks like it stopped letting people in because everybody who wants in is in. All right. I think we're ready to go, Commissioner. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, John Kafalis, Larimer County Commissioner, here with Michelle Bird, who will introduce herself and in a moment give us a quick overview of how the platform works and how we can engage in, in discussion, community conversation. Um, let's see. I think we have about, so far we have about 13, 11 participants. I think we had 27 that are registered. Uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, well, first of all, to welcome you all and, and hope that you're all doing well uh, these days, continue to be very challenging. Uh, I have a couple of things that I wanna touch on. Uh, in, the, in the coming week, there are some uh, activities that the commissioners are doing, work sessions, et cetera, that I think are, uh, that folks would be interested in, in hearing about. And of course, I can give an overview of the um, upcoming NISP hearing schedule and anything else that folks are interested in. So with that said, uh, again, welcome. Uh, thank you for taking the time on a Saturday morning when we could all be outside uh, getting some good exercise and, and properly physically distancing from one another. Um, but here we are, and it's, it's a good thing that we are. Michelle? Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, everybody. Um, nice to see you all on this morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, just a few things. If you haven't joined us via a Zoom webinar before and, and kind of experienced our virtual community conversation, um, you'll notice this platform's a little bit different than our normal or what you might be used to in a Zoom meeting. Um, you'll see that at the bottom of your screen, if you have used, if you're using Zoom on either your laptop or in your phone or a tablet. Um, you have some different options than normal. You have that Q&A option. Um, that's how we ask, um, instead of the chat box, um, we use this Q&A option. It's a little more secure for you folks um, in terms of not allowing others to post maybe links that could put viruses, if you were to click on it, viruses on your computer. Um, so if you have questions as we're going along today, you have two options. One, use that Q&A that Q&A function if you want to type in your question. Two, you can raise your hand. Um, again, if you're using the Zoom app or your laptop um, on your phone or on a, a tablet, you can raise your hand um, and that'll alert me that you want to talk. Um, and once I allow you to talk, you'll have to unmute yourselves too. Typically, the mute button is in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. If you've called in, um, your key to letting us know you want to talk is star nine. So to raise your hand, you hit star nine, and I'll let you know that I've allowed you to talk, and then you'll hit star six, but I'll walk you through it when we get there. Um, so two things to remember, if you want to talk, either raise your hand or press star nine if you've called in. Um, otherwise, that Q&A option is there for you. Commissioner, that's all I have. Thank you kindly, uh, Michelle. And do you want to say anything about Baby Yoda in the background there? Will that Baby Yoda be available to comfort us if we need it? Of course, that is exactly why Baby Yoda is here. Baby Yoda is my co-pilot my co on all these Zoom meetings um, to give me direction <laughs> or a little bit of humor if needed, so. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying Baby, yep. Yoda, Baby Yoda's <laughs> presence. So uh, with that said, uh, just, just a couple of things I want to touch on, but before I do that, just as a reminder so folks know that um, even during this, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic situation, we have done our best to, you know, to try to be available to, to folks in the community. And, and I, in particular, have basically been doing three what, what I call community conversations per month. Uh, by and large, they have been remote or virtual using this, this webinar, this uh, webinar platform. Uh, interestingly, we did have our first in-person community conversation 
up at Red Feather Lakes uh, last Thursday. And uh, it was um, one of those topics that draws people out. And we actually, you know, we, we, we did all the public health protocols, but we did have it in person. And we probably, counting the presenters, we had about maybe 40 people. So we were under that 50-person that, um, uh, limit. We were inside, but we had the chair spaced in such a way. Everyone wore uh, face coverings. There were some hand sanitizers available. We kept all the windows open, the door open, you know, to try to allow for air circulation. But that was, that was interesting. Um, last time when we met for our Fort Collins Laporte uh, community conversation, which was virtual last month, uh, we did a poll and folks resoundingly said that they wanted to continue to use this platform. And unless things change otherwise, I think that's what we'll do for the Fort Collins uh, Laporte one. Uh, my next one is in Wellington. We combine that with the um, uh, folks who live up in Buckeye and Waverly, and that will be next Thursday uh, at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, and actually, we're going to do that one in person, and we'll see how that goes. But we, uh, the T-Bar Inn is where we have historically uh, done these up in Wellington, uh, in the, in the um, spirit of Commissioner Lou Gator, who, who really was a big advocate and champion for these kinds of meetings. Um, the the T Bar Inn now has outside dining there in the parking lot, and so we're going to do this outside, and we're just going to count on um, uh, the weather cooperating. So just keep that in mind. We'll be at the T Bar Inn next Thursday at 7:30 or so, and we'll be outside. and And a lot of that, in my view, is to we want to support that 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 restaurant, that local business, because local businesses are still having a really hard time with all this. So let me just quickly touch on a few things that I think are important that folks would be interested to learn about. Uh, one is the uh, Larimer County uh, mitigation plan. And probably most of you know by now that the county received a letter from the State Department of Public Health and Environment. I think it was on a Friday. Um, it was uh, uh, July 17th, I believe. And we, and we essentially had the weekend our public health folks and our economic development folks at the weekend to, to put together a quote mitigation plan, which uh, which basically was a response to the concern from the state that because we've seen an increase, uh, a trend in increase in COVID-19 positive cases, uh, we needed to provide this mitigation plan, which we did on Monday by noon. I think that, that was July 20th. So this Monday will be two weeks that we've been operating and, and monitoring indicators, et cetera, through the mitigation plan. And I, my understanding is that next week, the first week in August, and by the way, welcome to August 1st, uh, but next week we should get uh, some feedback from the state in terms of how we're doing you know, to shift or change the trajectory of what's been happening. The last couple of days have trended well. We have had some pretty, uh, some big spikes in, in COVID-19 positive days and and overall though we, we we seem to be coming back to a better a better direction um, uh, currently the COVID-19 uh, related hospitalizations as I looked at the site the data dashboard this morning I think we were at 11 or so and and so why this is important is if the state determines that we're heading not in a good you know we're heading in a in a, a, a cha more challenging direction they could revoke the the uh, waiver, the variance that we received back in May, either parts of it or the or the um, entirety of it, and that would that would mean that some of the things that we have more flexibility and local control over, we would um, we could lose some of that, and that would have impacts on on businesses, and 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 we don't you know we there's a campaign right now that's keep NoCo open, and and so our, we're trying to continually balance public health, safety, and welfare with, you know, allowing for reasonable, uh, uh, you know, businesses to be able to open. So that's the mitigation plan. The next thing I'd like to touch on is, um, I'm sure you're aware that NISP, uh, Northern Integrated Supply Project, um, the hearings, the, the county commissioner hearings will begin on um, uh, Monday, August 17th. Um, and at our normal evening land use hearing time, which I think is about 6.30 p.m. And it'll be, people can access that 
uh, through the broadcasting. It'll be broadcast, it'll be on, on live streamed, et cetera. Or people can be there in person. Uh, I think up to, at that point, we'll, assuming we can continue to have up to 50 people uh, indoors, uh, you know, folks will have that opportunity as well. August 17th is, is for information purposes only. Public testimony will not, will not happen on that evening. And that's where staff will provide information. Uh, thanks for putting up the links. Uh, uh, Michelle, you're, you're definitely awesome. Um, but staff will provide their, uh, their um, report on the uh, NISP 1041 permit application. And we'll also have a presentation from Northern. Um, and that's what the purpose of, of the first meeting is August 17th. Uh, the 24th and the 31st will be for public testimony. In total, we've blocked out about 12 hours of time where, where folks can testify. And if you haven't gone to the website, which um, uh, Michelle just put up, you, and if you haven't read the paper, I think yesterday, uh, we did change um, somewhat at my urging uh, that now each individual will have up to three minutes uh, to be able to speak, uh, either virtually uh, or, or, or in person. And also, People will have the ability, they can't pull their time, but if they're part of a group, uh, an organized group, let's say Save the Pooter or, or an HOA or something like that, they will need to coordinate and they could have five people uh, with each having their three minutes of, of time where there could be a coordinated presentation up to 15 minutes. But it's not like one person will be given those, you know, all of that time. It'll have to be three minutes, then you go to the next person and, and so on. So that's how the public testimony is gonna go down. Um, we have blocked out two days or, or two times for public testimony. And if we need the second, the second day, I think we, with three minutes per person, it would accommodate up to 200 folks who may want to testify you know, regarding this issue. And then the plan is either on the 31st, if, if we don't need additional public testimony time or September 2nd, uh, we will be going through that the last phase of uh, deliberation questions and ultimately ultimately rendering a decision so that is with regard to nisp as far as what's coming up this week really really fast um, people should be aware that we have a number of uh, work sessions that i think would be of um, uh, people would be interested to know about on monday this coming monday august 3rd at 10 a.m. and all this stuff is broadcast, all of this stuff is live streamed, and uh, again, you are able to attend in person because we do these things downstairs in the, in the, um, in the first floor hearing room. But at 10 o'clock, we will have a presentation from the, um, the ranch complex. The, you know, we've been working on the um, ranch master plan uh, the, and, and there have been updates and we're moving forward with redevelopment of that facility based on the revenues that are provided from the county, the dedicated county sales tax. So that's at 10 o'clock. Uh, at 11 a.m., uh, now it's for an hour, we will have a joint work session with the city of Fort Collins and, and, and you know, folks from Loveland, I believe, um, uh, to uh, get a presentation regarding the alternate site search for the, um, the behavioral health facility and campus. I, I think folks are aware that um, there's been a lot of discussion and what we agreed to about uh, 45 days ago was to bring together our folks and, and look for some other possible sites uh, rather than the one that's currently proposed, which is on the northwest corner of uh, Trilby and, um, uh, and, and Taft Hill. So that's gonna be at 11 o'clock Decisions will not be made, uh, but we will have a presentation. And based on preliminary uh, information that I have, there are two sites that have been identified that are part of the, pre the City of Fort Collins presentation. Uh, there's a third one that wasn't recommended with, because what we're, one of the criterion, the selection criterion, uh, says that we are, it's preferred that we actually buy or a, a, you know, a parcel of land, 40 acres, that it would accommodate the needs of this campus. Uh, there, most recently, there is a third site that has come up, which will be part of the discussion, which, which will make things even more interesting. 
but there are some sites uh, that'll be discussed on Monday, August 3rd. And then on Wednesday, this is new, but it's in the, it's in the weekly schedule. Uh, I think it's at three o'clock. Uh, Commissioner Johnson asked for a work session, a commissioner's work session with our, you know, with our facilities folks, our behavioral health folks uh, to kind of give, you know, process the information, help us process the information that we received on Monday. So that's happening on Wednesday. And the other thing that's happening on Wednesday that I think is uh, relevant uh, to what, what folks care about is um, I think at 1.30, the normal time for our work session, we have our budget folks who are gonna come in and by service area, I think I have that right, Michelle, service category, for example, one of our service categories or service areas is uh, human economic health. And within that service area, there are at least a half a dozen uh, departments, including uh, Department of Health and Environment, Economic and Workforce Development, uh, Human Services, et cetera. So we will have um, a SWAT uh, strength, weakness, excuse me, <laughs> strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats update because we, we use that methodology to, to see where, you know, where things are going well, where we need to kind of focus on, et cetera. That will occur at 1.30. And then there will also be an, a demonstration of a, um, a budget transparency tool that I have actually been advocating for. Uh, it's called a Budget Balancing Act. And we did purchase this, uh, this tool. And so we'll be doing a demo for the commissioners. And my hope is that we can um, implement this tool to create better uh, t transparency on the budget process, uh, the county budget process, that, and, and also to make it easier for folks to participate, to engage. Well, so much for short um, uh, updates, but I think that's all. But I thought that stuff would be important for folks to know about. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Well, Commissioner, we have a few comments, some questions. We have a hand raised. So I'm going to try to do this in the order that it happened. I'm going to get the comments. Um, I'm going to do a couple comments. And then Hal had his hand raised. We'll go to Hal. Alan um, asked a few questions in the Q&A. And then it looks like Alice has her hand raised. So that's the order I'm going to go in. OK. Um, Alan just had a couple comments on masks and meeting indoors. Um, I, I think he just wants to let everybody know that masks are important. Exceptional ventilation is even more critical. And it has to do with the simple measure of ventilation um, is CO2 concentration indoors. Viral airborne transmission goes up significantly when indoor CO2 concentration increases. So that's just a little comment from Alan. I'm going to put those live so that everybody can see that information. Um, and do you, do you want to comment on that, Commissioner? No. Okay. No. Uh Let's jump to, um, Hal's had his hand up, so Hal, I'm going to allow you to talk. And don't forget your mute button. You're going to have to unmute yourself. It looks like you're ready to go, Hal. Well, good morning, uh, Commissioner Kafalas. Um, good, good morning, Hal. Where's my cup of coffee? Well, I, I look forward to <laughs> buying you. I look forward to um, being with you again at Mio Mai as soon as possible, yes. Okay, and that's a good segue into uh, what I have. Number one, um, I want to thank you for the opportunity at the last meeting to vote on whether we do this thing this way or we all get back together and get sick together. Um, my recommendation or my thought on that is, and you know, some people say, well, let's go to the first of the year. I don't think anybody can predict anything about when this is going to be cooled off. So from my perspective, doing it this way until such time as everybody feels comfortable and safe, um, let's do it this way. Um, that means through the, probably through the first of the year, maybe after the uh, election. Oh. Um, so anyway, that's what I, that's the first thing I want to know or I want to help and you're welcome. And the next thing, uh, I was quoted on a document that I sent to code compliance 
that it was okay for somebody to block an emergency exit with a fence. And they said the county, quote unquote, uh, said that's okay. Now, that kind of made me a little bit nervous. I want to know who the county is. Uh, who do we talk to about stuff like that? Uh, talking to code compliance is probably a dead end as far as I'm concerned. And uh, the issue is, who is the person we talk to other than you? And if it has to be you, well, you've got a job. Um, bottom line is, who is it? Who's the county? Well, my first, um, uh, my response to your question is this. I would think that in, given this situation that you just described regarding uh, whether someone can block, you were saying that, Someone has put up um, a barrier or a gate that's blocking another person's driveway. What, could you run that by no, me again? No, no, no. Um, way back when, um, this uh, person was uh, granted an easement through yeah. his property uh, 35 feet wide from gate to gate. Um, he still has a gate on the west end, which is okay because it's not locked. But on the east end here, he has uh, four strands of uh, barbed wire okay. and T posts across that easement. And, you know, and I was told that, it, oh, the county says that's okay. It is not. Uh, Hal, in light of that clarification, I think um, one of the folks that you might want to reach out to would be the director of our community development department. Her name is Leslie, Leslie Ellis and she oversees all the planning stuff. Um, uh, and, and that relates to looking at plats and looking at easements. And if there's any question about, you know, the, the, the easements and their location, I think those are the folks who could provide that information. And that, I think that would help inform uh, the code compliance um, response. Yeah, uh, the, the reason, yeah, and I hear what you're saying, but uh, the easement isn't in question because you guys okayed it. And yeah. I believe there's a reception number on that. I have to look that up. Okay. Okay. I know that's a, that's a naughty question. The yes. other thing I have is um, there is an organization someplace in this state that deals with water shares. In other words, you have to have a certain number of water shares to do certain things. Um, and I don't believe there are any water shares on any of these properties up here. Um, so who would be the point of contact or where would be the point of contact for that information and for either a complaint or a discussion about it? And, and the information you seek, Hal, is um, up where you live. What is the distribution of water shares? Is that correct? Yes, sir. Wouldn't one possible source of that information would be the um, irrigation of the ditch companies that that um, that use water from that area. Uh, I mean, otherwise, otherwise the at the state level, Hal, um, the, the thought that comes to my mind, and this is something we could follow up on if I'm if I'm not giving out accurate information, is the um, the state water engineer. I mean, they're the ones that um, review issues related to water rights and water shares and, and and we can we can find out you know the contact information there but those are my two thoughts it would be the the irrigation companies that are that are moving water around uh you know depending on where you're located um and and also at the state level i would think that um uh, the state water engineer uh, would be uh, that office would be one and they actually have regional offices and we could we could look into that there's there's folks who work out of the Greeley office and we've um, interfaced with them. So I hope that's a, a reasonable answer at the moment, uh, Hal. Yeah, it's, it's excellent. And I, it, you know, the state water engineer, I think is the place to go. Irrigation ditch guys, uh, they're interested in, they have water shares and they're interested in that and they sell that water to other organizations or other people. So yeah, the state water engineer, and if I, if I remember very correctly, looking back on when we bought this property, um, we don't have 
a uh, we don't have any water rights basically we don't have yes. any uh, um, whatever you want to call them um, and, and and how we because i know there's a regional office and we you know again we've interfaced with uh, you know the, the state is divided up into various regions yeah. and, and so we we do have uh, relationships with the people that represent this region on a number of levels so that we can get you that information yes Super. I, I really appreciate that because this battle continues. <laughs> yes, there, there's a few battles going on out there these days. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, and the thing is, is some people look the other way and other people say, well, this is important, but we got other things to do. And I, I'm going to be a bulldog. I'm going to be a bulldog on the issue. Well, so I appreciate anyway. that. It seems like over the last six months, you've been a kinder bulldog. Oh, <laughs> Well, it's going to get ugly. Okay, <laughs> it's well, going to get ugly. Uh, a good segue to move on to the next person. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> oh, Thank <Lord>. you, Hal. <laughs> oh, um, boy. We haven't, Hal, um, I just wanted to let you know, Alan suggested maybe um, the issue with the right of way, talk to the fire marshal as well. Um, I'm not, I, I don't know anything about that subject, but I wanted to let you know that Alan thought the fire marshal might be a good um, option as well. Um, Commissioner Allen had a couple questions. First one is about NISP um, process. Um, he asked, public testimony is during the workday, not the evening, question mark. The, the, um, we are providing times during the day and in the evening. If my memory serves me correctly, Alan, uh, the first um, uh, public testimony hearing date, August 24th, I think I think we're starting at 3 p.m., going till 5:30, taking an hour break for for dinner or whatever folks do it during that hour, and then resuming at 6:30 till when we you know often um, uh, end the hearing, and that would be at 10 o'clock. So we are offering daytime and evening opportunities for folks to provide public testimony. Um, second question. Um from Alan is, for the alternate site work session, could the meeting materials other than simply the agenda be posted online? And I, I think I can help everybody with this one. They are posted online, the whole packet is, and I'm going to copy the link right now and put it in the chat box so that um, they can you. see, let's see if that, that might not have worked, hold on. Just a second. I'm going to post the page that has it all. And um, you need to select instead of agenda, there's a second column that says packet. Um, and that's what you want to click on, Alan. Uh, thank you, Michelle. And yeah. Thank you very much. And, and Alan, um, if, if that doesn't work, I have the, um, the PowerPoint presentation. I think it's about seven or eight slides that the city has put together that again was a collaborative effort with the county, the city of Loveland and other municipalities to try and look at some other sites. Uh, the, the packet will include uh, two sites that are mostly along the, um, uh, the Highway 287 corridor between, uh, you know, between Loveland and Fort Collins. Uh, and, and then there's this um, uh, UC Health property uh, that is, um, might, would be available for a long-term lease, but that was not recommended because the intent here is to actually purchase the property if we go somewhere else. There's another site that's not going to be included in the packet uh, because that came up late and recently, um, and, and that's something you'll hear more about on Monday, but that's not listed in the packet, I don't believe. Commissioner, it looks like Alan's having some problems finding it, so would you mind if I can share my screen and show him where to look for it? I, I, of course not, Michelle, I, I don't mind. All right, so everybody, I'm going to share my screen. And Alan, um, what you want to do is that link I sent you guys, it takes you to this, this um, page. You. If you scroll down, um, we're looking at this work session right here regarding alternative site results. Um, there's two columns, one for the agenda and one for the packet. There you, you go. Click on this one for the packet. Let me open it up. Um, there's first the agenda, and then here is yep. the presentation from the city of Fort Collins about yes. the sites. So um, let me stop sharing my screen now. That's great. That's great, Michelle. And let me pull back up my, my stuff here. Okay, so. 
And Michelle, may I add one more quick thing on the behavioral health issue? Yeah, go ahead, Commissioner, of course. Uh, Alan and, and folks who are, list, who are participating in, and interested in this topic, so the, the plan at this point is at the subsequent administrative matters meeting, which I, would be scheduled for August 11th, maybe? Uh, is that right? What's um, August? Well, one of those, yeah, or, or August 9th. Uh, I'm trying to, no, the 8th is Saturday, 9th, 10th, yeah, the 11th. So on August 11th, when we have our nine o'clock administrative matters meeting, the intent it, there is to render a decision regarding the location of the behavioral health facility. But we wanted to have a week to process this a little bit. Thank you, Commissioner. Karen, I hope has an easy question for you. She asked, oh. what is the human economic health meeting? I think she's referencing, was it the budget we were talking about? I'm not 100% I'm not sure. The, the SWAT update. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, Karen. And um, uh, what I was m mentioning earlier, and it should be, um, uh, it should be listed in that weekly schedule thing, but that that Michelle put up, and I know you're very familiar with our website. Um, but on Wednesday uh, at 1:30, at a scheduled work session, there will be two uh, basic topics. One is to look at all the different uh, service areas or service categories, like human and economic health. Uh, another one, for example, is uh, community planning, infrastructure, and resources. But to look at all of those service areas and the departments within those service areas and, and do a, an update regarding the, the SWOT analysis uh, methodology, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And then the other part of that work session uh, on Wednesday that begins at 1.30 is to uh, the budget folks, and the budget folks will be presenting all this uh, they're going to be presenting a, a demo of this Budget Balancing Act, which is something I've been pushing for, and I'm hoping we can deploy a, a version of this, you know, in, in 2020 uh, for folks to participate in the budget process. And certainly 2021, is, you know, we really get this thing going. Does that answer your question, Karen? Karen, if not, either raise your hand or, or let us know um, in the Q&A. Yeah. So Commissioner Alice has had her hand raised for a while. So Alice, I'm gonna allow you to talk. Yeah, Karen says it did answer her question. Thanks, Karen. Okay. Yeah. Um, Alice, we're gonna allow you to talk and then you're just gonna have to unmute yourself. It's gonna be in the bottom left hand. Oh, looks like you're ready to go. Go ahead, Alice. Hi, John and Michelle. Hi. Um, Hello. My concern is also about the COVID health issues. Um, it concerns the county elections. I worked for the July primary for a couple of weeks. Yes. Um, in the midpoint office where they process ballots. Yes. Also concerning the county health department who told them the rules that they needed to follow, which they did a lot of mitigation. Yes. And a lot, lot of, and it all seemed good. But what I'm concerned about is they condoned the non compliance of wearing masks, specifically in the area of where I worked, which was signature verification, which involves a lot of waiting for the Gillis machine to process more ballots before you can start working again. Yeah. They allowed people to sit at their desk and talk without their masks on. And I was not comfortable with that. So I started wearing an N95 so that other people could not wear their masks. And I also agreed to work, I've been called uh, in November. I feel that if I say anything, that I will be told I do not have to work, but they'll keep the people who say they cannot breathe with masks. When I also think if you cannot breathe with a mask on, your health is already compromised. Why should you be risking your health? So I have a lot to say on this subject. I have a lot of ideas about how people need to go outside during their break, our break and not sit there talking without masks. And, but I also feel like I will be retaliated against, and I know there's a law against it, if I say <laughs> anything about it. I've also put my name in with the County Health Department with a complaint, but I have no idea if they've acted on it. And I was told 
that they did not have time to come back to me and tell me the result of my complaint. So I'm sitting here not knowing the result of my complaint, knowing that I could talk to the supervisor from the county who called me and asked me to rework about this, but probably she'll tell me I have reason to believe because someone else did not work uh, after they went to, a, you know, after the first day, that I'm perfectly, they're perfectly willing to not let me work if I'm concerned about their health problem things. But if there was one person that had COVID in that building where at times there's 200 people without the ventilation you were talking about, without everyone wearing masks all the time, there would have been a cluster. So Alice, may I respond? Yes. Thank you. First of all, thank you for uh, uh, working as an election judge. It's obviously really important and we'll need more folks for the uh, general election up in, in, in November. Uh, first thing I, I would say is that based on conversations with Angela Myers and based on, you know, what sharing, what, you know, some of the um, uh, protocols they put in place with, you know, the, 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 the plastic, um, you know, people are kind of uh, all secluded in different, different work areas. They put up plastic and all of those things. I think a lot of good things were being done. You raised the question that if people were waiting for the, um, uh, the machines that identified the signatures or, or verified the signatures before you guys need to look at them, that it, it sounds like when, when during that waiting period, folks are sitting at their desks and they're able to converse and they're not being required to um, uh, wear face masks. Uh, and, and maybe there are some other issues. So uh, I, I would say this, first of all, if, um, if you would like to uh, uh, email me uh, with, with the specific concerns uh, and, and in the email, in the subject line, you could put the word deliberative or private uh, to, you know, to protect your privacy if you have concerns. But uh, if you would send those to me and or Michelle, uh, between the two of us, we can provide that feedback to uh, the clerk our, our Larimer County clerk and recorders, who I think would be very receptive. And believe me, um, in my meetings with her, I know that you know pu public health, safety, and welfare is, is paramount. So um, that would be one recommendation. And that is that you um, uh, e email us, put private or, or deliberative in the, uh, in the subject line so it doesn't go out on the, on the web email. Uh, and, and, and then Michelle and I will follow up uh, with the clerk uh, to bring this, these matters to her attention and ask her for uh, what, what, she, what her observations are and what she intends to do about it to make sure that folks like you feel safe to be able to go back in November. Does, okay. does that help? I can send help, you an Alice? email, but, I, but one, one of the things was that she said, it's not our position to ask people that have health concerns so if you see someone without a mask, don't say anything um, because they may have a health concern. I think someone yeah. who has a health concern and cannot wear a mask should not be working. And I have reason to believe there's plenty of people who want to work who, as election judge, who have not been called. And Alice, last uh, question I would have on this, and, and again, happy to talk offline or, or do the email thing or whatever. Uh, but is it your impression that um, the, the folks that you observed who were waiting and conversing and not wearing face masks, was, the, was it your impression that those people were either stating or, or were considered as having um, health-related issues that precluded them from wearing the face mask? No, um, okay. there was one person who got a shield instead of a mask. Oh, okay. Said, yeah she had a problem but the ones that weren't wearing it would wear it while they were working when you are verifying signatures you speak a lot less than when you're chit-chatting yes you, know, you, you get to the point the other thing with um when you work as a verifier is you switch positions with your partner so that little three foot space that i have between the curtains number one you pull back the curtain so you both can see the screen and, and number two, my partner's nose was never covered. And uh, it's, I think it's mainly the breaks and I have ideas that pe they should not stay there during the break. I think they need to provide some place outside or a way to call us back in. I have ideas.
but well, and, and actually, not let Alice... people sit there and talk. My, my partner, I told her my concern, but she would sit there knitting without a mask, but she'd put it on when I'd come to be polite. And it wasn't a partisan thing, you know? It was, yeah. it just, I think it's nature of the job. People didn't want to be sitting there with masks, but they were allowed to sit there. Well, so they took Alice, their masks off and left them off. Alice, so the fact that you have uh, ideas or proposed solutions to your concerns or ways to address, that's even better. So again, if you're comfortable emailing us the way I suggested, uh, please provide whatever level of detail you want, including um, ways of addressing your concerns, and we'll provide that feedback to the clerk uh, and, and ask for a response. Uh, will that work for you? Yes, it will. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, Commissioner, I have some questions from Pam. Um, let me read this out loud. Pam says, I'm an employee with PSD and I'm concerned with the reopening of schools, especially since CSU just had two outbreaks <sighs> and MLB couldn't even open their season safely with all the resources they have. It seems like we are using our children and teachers as guinea pigs in a terrible experiment. Can the county commissioners inject some sanity into the school district's decision to make the school district's decision making process to reopen? It is not safe to have in person school while cases are rising in, Col in Colorado. It is truly a life or death decision that is being made. And, and so the, the underlying question there is whether the county can inject some semblance of sanity to some of these decisions regarding the reopening of schools. And it's not just PSD, Poudre School District, but it's also uh, Thompson School District, Estes Park, and there's some other regional school districts where, you know, are the families that they may live in, you know, in, in Weld County, for example, and work in, in, in Fort Collins or in Loveland. So the, the, the answer to your question is this, or at least this is what I would offer as an answer. Uh, and is it Pam? I, I, let's see, Pam. Okay. First of all, um, uh, there's ongoing communication with the school districts, with the, the school board, well, the sc school superintendent and staff between our public health department and, um, uh, and, and the school district folks. That is, 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 is how we are injecting some level of sanity into these decisions. If you'll recall, uh, the, the, the Poudre School District came up with the four different options or fa phases. You know, the phase four, I think, was, um, you know, students are back in the classroom all the time, four or five days a week. Uh, and, and, and in light of everything right now, uh, the, school, the school district has decided to push the start date back a week. So rather than August 17th, um, it'll be August 24th, as I understand it, and that is even subject to change. Uh, the first three weeks will be uh, some type of hybrid model. And I think you probably know all this, you read it in the newspaper. So there is a phased in approach and then seeing where things are at after the Labor Day would determine, you know, uh, if, if we're gonna increase uh, the, the, you know, the in-person learning that, that really we all wanna get, what we all wanna get back to. Um, just the other day, in fact, uh, I, was I was speaking to someone who, from Laporte, who, who sends their children uh, to um, uh, one of the charter schools, Ridgeview Classical School. And uh, I learned that um, even though they're, they're a school district chartered uh, a school, they still have a lot of autonomy about how they would reopen. And they were waiting for guidance, specific guidance from the public health department uh, to be posted regarding uh, schools and childcare. And, and that was done that, you know, on, I think it was on Monday that when we were having these conversations. So there is very, very specific guidance that the school districts are adhering to, you know, regarding this, this phased in approach of, of opening up the classrooms. Um, and, and, and in fact, one other thing I'll say, uh, Pam, is that um, uh, the health department uh, is, is also, um, I think part of the delay was to give us more time to hire additional people, uh, people who are trained to be quote, contact tracers. And so, um, and, and, and so that, that's, that's just one other thing to be aware of, that we're, we're trying to make sure that uh, there aren't any outbreaks 
although I share your concerns with regard to CSU and some of the outbreaks we've seen there. Um, and all your concerns are valid, and especially you know, school teachers, maybe older school teachers, those are all very valid concerns. I understand that the younger children, uh, there's a little bit more flexibility based on the science, and, um, and the middle schoolers and the high schoolers, there will be a lot more um, uh, precautions taken uh, to address those concerns. That's, that's the best I can do. Oh, and the other thing I would mention is next Wednesday, I didn't mention this in terms of the weekly schedule, I, I, it should be posted. Um, we have our uh, somewhat regular meeting, uh, it's called the liaison meeting, uh, the county, I participate, uh, the school district, and, and generally the, the, the school superintendent and other staff participate, some school board members, and the city. That is going to be on Wednesday, August 5th, I believe from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. And, and I would think it's a virtual meeting, and I, I would think it's a public meeting, so uh, folks should be able to access that as well. But in, in conclusion, um, if, if you have specific questions that you'd like me to ask the school district folks um, on, on Wednesday, I'm, I'm more than happy to do that and, and get that information back to you. This thing is, move, is, a, is, a, is a moving target every, every day, every couple of hours. And right now, as of today, this is what's, you know, what the school district is planning to do, as well as Thompson, as well as Estes. Uh, th there's some variation on this. Now the charter schools have some direction, guidance, and they will be putting out their, um, their reopening dates and their procedures, you know, I'm, I'm sure very soon. Thank you. That's, I did the best I could on that one. Yeah, Commissioner, um, Pam just had a, a follow-up question, oh, gosh, and maybe yeah. maybe this is something you you can address offline, or it's up to you. But she said, "How do we address guidelines by the health department that the school district is not following?" How do we address guidelines from the health department that the school district is not following? Correct. Yes. Um, well, that's. I think that's a question we can follow up on because I mean the normal. The normal channels, if you know, uh, uh, and it was alluded to earlier, if you, uh, if you're a community, if you have a concern about a COVID-19 related concern, a community concern, or perhaps uh, a business concern, there is a way of providing that input uh, to, um, you know, through the website to the county. There's a form you can fill out. That's one way. Uh, the, the second way, I think, which if you're not, if you're getting tired of all this e internet stuff is we still do have our, uh, and Michelle can speak to this, we still do have our joint information center that is operating and there are, there are a number of uh, trained staff that are, that, are, uh, you know, that are answering the phones uh, five days a week, I think from eight or 8.30, nine till 4.30 or so, and, and, there's some, and there's Spanish speaking folks as well. Um, but that, if, if you have a concern, you could call that number. And I used to have that number memorized, but I'm sure Michelle has it memorized and will share that with us. Those are two thoughts. I, I don't have it memorized, Commissioner, but it, I will it's, put it in the oh, chat. Yeah, you'll find it. Um, and Pam just wanted you to know that she did com, um, complete that form. Um, oh. So um, if you're okay with it, Commissioner, we have some other questions. Oh, of course, yes. Yeah, so we're going to go to Mary here, who, who put this question in quite a bit ago. Uh -huh. Hi, Mary. Um, she says, Commissioner, please address the waste transfer station site on Trilby and Taft. 30 to 40 semi-trucks traveling Trilby two times a day, Monday through Friday, will seriously impact many neighborhoods on Trilby and Carpenter. Why not choose a site along I-25 near the county fair site? Yes, Mary, thank you, and I appreciate your engagement. Um, uh, the first part of my response to your question is that I actually, um, uh, I spent uh, Thursday morning, I think it was, doing various site visits, including uh, visiting my first ever uh, feedlot, which was an interesting experience, uh, but it also included going to the um, that intersection, uh, Trilby and Taft Hill with our our director of community planning infrastructure, et cetera, Lori Kadrich. Uh, we, the two of us went to that uh, intersection, Trilby and Taft, 
and I just wanted to get a visual of, um, you know, of that space because as is currently proposed, 40 acres in that north, uh, northwest corner of that intersection would be de dedicated for the, the behavioral health. And then I was looking at various stakes in the ground that are kind of preliminarily marking things. The transfer station would be to the west of that, um, maybe another quarter mile or so. Uh, so I, I wanted, that was important for me and also is important for me to have a, a better visual of the, um, the wildflower uh, 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 subdivision, which is Caddy Corner. And, and I think you, you may live there, Mary, I, I, I can't remember. And then up on the foothills there is that Hidden Springs subdivision, uh, you know, up on the foothills. Uh, so I did do that and that was very helpful. To answer your question, a couple of things, let me see if I get this. Right, so uh, some of this is contingent now upon whether or not we actually make a decision to move the behavioral health facility. Um, uh, and and if, if the behavioral health facility campus is moved, then it could impact where the transfer station is. As folks know, uh, the current landfill north of there uh, uh, is set to close, I believe by 2024. Um, uh, one of the comments that I had, or one of the questions I had for Lori is, well, if we build the behavioral health facility that here, and as I look north, I could see that, that that one area where trucks are still going on the road, it's on the south end, and they're, you know, commercial garbage trucks and folks with their pickups, I mean, that is clearly visible, uh, you know, in terms of um, people uh, d depositing their solid waste. And I said, isn't if, if we do the, the behavioral health facility here, and, um, and let's say it's ready to go by 2022 or so, uh, won't, they be, won't they be interfacing with this, this visual and this, in, quote, industrial activity? And one of the things that Lori said to me is that that particular part of the current landfill, the south facing, that's going to be closed because that's the next one that will be sealed, these 20 acre cells. And any additional um, uh, solid waste uh, uh, dumping um, will be on the on the north end of all that because so that's one thing for folks to consider. But I guess the, the answer to your question is a, a lot of it depends on what happens with behavioral health if that changes. Currently, the transfer station is on Trilby. Trail, Based on the open house, I know there was a lot of concern about the trucks uh, trucks. You know, the, whether it's 30 to 40 or 60 to 80, uh, it is correct, uh, as I understand it, Mary, that, um, you know, there would be trucks going to the transfer station uh, and, and also pickup trucks, you know, regular folks uh, to, to, um, to unload their, their, the garbage, the trash, the stuff that's not going to be recycled. Um, and, uh, uh, and then it would be compacted and, and all of this is enclosed. And then other trucks would take it up to the new site, you know, the, the one north of Wellington. And th right now, the primary route, as you know, is, um, you know, coming off of Trilby and uh, uh, going east on Trilby to college and then a little bit down to Carpenter and then over to the highway. Uh, so I think there are things we can do to mitigate the concerns around truck traffic. Uh, and, and, and also to your question, well, why don't we do this on I-25? I mean, I think part of the answer is that the, the county owns this land. This land has been, you know, has been working as a landfill for since the 60s. And, and I think that's the primary reason why when, when we had the Northern Colorado Waste Shed uh, Coalition, a regional waste shed coalition, and they developed the Solid Waste Master Plan, uh, that's why we're focused on this property. It's 320 acres. Uh, eventually the, 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 the dump will close. It'll be a composting facility on the north end, uh, uh, yard waste, and then eventually food waste. The transfer station at this point on, on Trilby there. And then um, this has been delayed also, also but there were, there's um, an intent to uh, have construction and demolition material recycled, divert, uh, diverted. The goal is to have 40% diversion with our solid waste and, and, um, you know, and then deposit the the stuff that can't be recycled or reused in the new landfill north of Wellington. Thanks, Commissioner. Oh. Um, 
I'm I going. Oh, go ahead. No, I'm just sorry. Sometimes I get long winded. I people need to cut me off or let me know if. Uh, I mean, there are so many details to this, and I'll, I'll keep working on being more succinct. Well, for full information um, is always a good thing, Commissioner. So, <sighs> but I don't think you always have to apologize. And I wanted to just for full transparency for folks. Um, as people kind of put in just comments in the, the q and A, I I just make those live. Um, you know, we might not necessarily respond to all the comments if they don't have questions attached to them, but I did make them live so that everybody can see what those comments um, are that others have. Um, Hal has had his hand raised for quite a bit now, so we're going to go back to Hal. Hal, unmute yourself. Unmuted. Yay. <laughs> Okay, I have a, uh, uh, something that people, I don't know if they do it or not. Uh, you walk into stores, you see these uh, plexiglass shields all over the place, and you're talking yeah. about them in the, uh, the voting place where they do all the work there. Yes. Um, has anybody actually tested that? In other words, uh, do aerosols get past that? Um, that's what COVID-19 is, is an aerosol when it's sneezed or whatever coughed. And, you know, you can have all the plastic shields you want, and if they're not effective, then why have them? So the best policy is wear a mask. That's my comment, and I don't know what you're going to, you're, you're looking like you want to say something, so say it. <laughs> no, I'll just, again, thank you, and and that's the message, you know, that's one of the messages we've tried to drive home. On, on the matter of the, uh, has it been, you know, the plexiglass, uh, the, the separators and all of that, I, I don't know the answer to that, but Michelle, let's put that in uh, as a follow-up item. I'm, I'm sure the public health folks would know, you know, what kind of science um, and, and how effective are, you know, these plexiglass shields uh, in, in terms of at least minimizing or helping to reduce the spread of, of the, um, you know, in the air. Uh, you know, one thing that's interesting, if I may, Hal and others, that if you look at the data dashboard, uh, a, a, a new data a new data point is um, we are now showing a bar graph that indicates um, what percentage of the folks who tested co positive for COVID-19, what was their source of exposure? And I think when I looked at this thing early in the morning, I think it said something like 37% um, were people indicated they were they were exposed. They they got COVID nineteen because they were they were exposed to someone who tested positive uh, for COVID nineteen. I think another number I forget what that number is, Michelle. It's a smaller one percentage uh, was from community transmission, and and then there were ones from travel and and some other things. So people should um, watch that. I think that's very interesting. And 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 there's also a lot of unknown. Uh, we're also trying to break it up by demographics or ethnicity and race. So those additional data. Uh, uh, sets are really important, but we'll follow up on the plexiglass thing, Hal. And again, uh, we, we do our best to convey to people uh, about the masks and, and in the end, it comes down to personal responsibility and folks need to do the best they can to do the right thing. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and thanks, Hal. And I will say that I know um, the CDC does back the use of plexiglass, and we all know that the CDC does rely on science for their recommendations. Alan also had a comment on the plexiglass and the validity of that as a, as a safe um, a safe barrier, but uh, of course we all still need to continue to wear our masks. What was Alan's comment? Um, let look. me go to it. Let me see. Um, Sorry, I'm scrolling through everything. C CSU and CU have tested um, the plexiglass shields are not particularly effective, but it gives the impression that of some protection. Interesting. So that's what it's, Alan had to say. It's, it's nice to have um, a physicist uh, in, in, in our community conversations. Right. Um, so Kathy has a question. Yeah, I um, just saw it, yeah. Yeah, so um, with the increase of the semi the semi-traffic and motorcycle traffic in the Laporte area, this includes the Northwest area, North Taft and 54G West. How can we work on getting a noise ordinance similar to the one that Fort Collins has? Hmm. Well, 
it's funny you should mention noise up there and, and truck traffic. I recently um, have had some exchanges with a, um, one of your Laporte uh, neighbors up there uh, regarding a particular company um, where the semis that are going in there dropping off material and leaving, they're using um, uh, what are called Jake brakes. Um, and state law said, and, and they can be very noisy, very, very loud. And that's been the complaint. Uh, I, I think most people are familiar with what that sound is. If they're, they're a, a sort of a engine compression device that helps the, you know, these big semis slow down in addition to whatever braking systems they have. So uh, through that process, uh, we learned that um, uh, uh, there is a state law that requires the truckers who use this device, these Jake brakes, um, this Jake brake, uh, they have to have mufflers on there. And it's a minor criminal offense if they don't. En enforcement is always a tricky thing, but we did find out, um, and, and, and this would be helpful to get to your question about a local ordinance. I think the more people that express concerns about noise and truck traffic, the more it will um, elevate the issue. I, I think folks know how that works. And I learned that, um, uh, for example, the Larimer County Sheriff's Office typically does not get too involved in enforcing uh, noise-related issues. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Although I think it's Sergeant Robert Cook, I hope I have that right, um, uh, got this from the sheriff. Uh, he is in charge of traffic control and traffic related issues. And he might have been one of the folks that came up to one of our Laporte meetings back in the day. So there is a point of contact with the Larimer County Sheriff's Office, but they typically don't get too involved in this, but it doesn't hurt to, you know, as a non-emergency call or maybe contact them to Sergeant Robert Cook, you know, to let them know that you have concerns. Um, secondly, in terms of enforcement, uh, it turns out that the state patrol uh, the, the state patrol, they're more responsible for uh, enforcing the, the state law regarding mufflers and, 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 jet, and jake brakes. And, and I can't remember the, the, the person who is in charge of the Fort Collins, you know, out on the interstate, the state patrol office, but, but that might be someone. I'm sure you could look that up and hopefully I'm not con confusing that person with the name I just gave you for the sheriff's office. So that's a little bit on the enforcement side. On the um, how do we change the uh, um, uh, you know the the um, the ordinance the noise ordinance currently uh, there is a uh, at the county level there is a there are some noise ordinance or regulations and it's a, I, as I understand it, uh, it it's based on time of day but it's and it's based on decibel levels um, and and so uh, at, at night for example. It may be the, li the, the limit is 55 decibels, let's say, um, and, and if you exceed that, then you're violating the, you know, the, the, the ordinance or the regulation. So there is county level stuff. In, in terms of um, uh, the county's capacity to enforce or monitor that, uh, the health department uh, does, um, uh, is able to go out and, 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 and take some measurements if there are, there's a, you know, there's a particular concern. So that, that's one thing for folks to be aware of. In terms of changing the, the, the ordinance, Laporte is um, unincorporated. Uh, I, I don't know, ex honestly, I don't know exactly how that would work. If that means that as we update our land use code, which is, you know, which is in the process, uh, whether we should be um, uh, looking, well, looking at this issue and, and what the implications are for the, you know, for the town of Laporte. And, and if that doesn't adequately answer the question, let us know and we can follow up some more with our community development folks in particular, or our code compliance folks. But the health department monitors the noise issue. They can go out and take readings. Um, but again, we, uh, unless it's really egregious, it's, you know, we, um, you know, we try to work with our partners to, to do the enforcement. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so I just want to give a little bit of an update. So we don't have any Q&A questions right now. Hal does have his hand raised. Um, one just came in. So we'll go to Hal and then we'll go back to the question um, from Alan that just came in. 
but if folks have joined a little bit late and they don't know how to ask a question, I just want to remind them that they can ask in that Q&A section. If you called in on your phone, um, you know, dialed the number and, and you're just listening on your phone, the way you raise your hand is to hit star nine and that'll let us know that you have a question you want to ask um, and I will um, get to you and, and we'll, we'll let you ask your question. But Hal has his hand raised, so. All right, Hal, just go ahead. There and you go, you unmuted me. Um, just a quick uh, suggestion. There's an easy way to test those shields. Um, get yourself an aerosol spray of some kind of perfume or something that is easily identifiable. Uh, somebody gets on one side of that uh, shield, squirts a sp spray of uh, perfume, and if you can smell it on the other side within a minute or two, guess what? That shield is useless. Wear a mask. Well, Hal, thank you. That's helpful. Absolutely. And one other comment I will just add on this topic, and that is, it just came to me, and that is that whether it's plexiglass masks, I mean, what we are trying to do is a multiple protective measures that all together, the cumulative effect of that is to try to, as much as possible, minimize a community spread or community transmission. So I think one could make the case based on common sense, uh, which I think sometimes we lack these days, that if a person is washing their hands uh, meticulously, if a person is doing the best to keep their mask on, if there are stores, grocery stores, or like if you go into the county office on the second floor where Michelle and I hang out, you'll see that we've actually put up uh, plexiglass uh, that are hanging from the ceiling of there uh, in terms of where our front desk folks are there. And, and, and of course, that's to protect them because they're dealing with the public. And, and then of course, we do require people to wear masks when they come into the courthouse building. But I think the cumulative practices are, are what we need to be doing uh, in, in order to try to reduce the, uh, the spread and get us back on track so that the state doesn't come back to us next week and say, we're gonna take away these parts of your variants or we're gonna revoke the whole thing. And then, you know, restaurants, um, large gatherings, all of those kinds of things could be impacted. And that's not gonna be good for folks who wanna, you know, earn a living. Correct, Commissioner. And one thing too, I think we've gotten off the, the track of is reminding people that staying home is the best way um, to prevent. Well, I'd like to be able to do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I if mean, you can stay home, right? And, and, and to that point, I mean, you know, even the county, our policy is that as many as can work from home. I mean, even with our, our, our commissioner's budget office there on the second floor, we, we have it in such a way that the, the folks who are normally there 100% of the time, they, they alternate days that they're there. So in other words, we don't have more than 50% of our workforce physically present. You know, as commissioners, we typically have uh, work sessions, et cetera, as you just learned, Monday through Wednesday. So that, that requires us for the most part, although we could do it virtually, you know, to, to, to come in and we're there physically present. Um, more and more, we're doing stuff downstairs in the, in the commissioner's um, hearing room, and then where, where appropriate, we do still do stuff up in the conference room. But we have a lot of people working from home. I'm working from home four days a week, and then I typically go in the office, you know, three days a week. And when I say four days a week, I mean the weekends too. All right, can you? So um, Alan has a question. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer it or not, but um, I'm going to throw it off to you. Yeah. So he asked if you would address the Laporte gravel ruling. Alan, the short answer is no, because um, I'm sure you're aware that there was a recent decision a uh, two to one decision from the commissioners to participate in, I guess what's referred to as a cross appeal. Um, and and uh, so this is back in the courts. And as you know, uh, when things are under, you know, in, in litigation, uh, we are advised not to, um, to really get into that. Correct. Thank you, Commissioner, for addressing that. Logan has a question. Oh. Logan says, I have heard that the county is going to finalize the 10-year plan for horse tooth open space. 
I'm curious to hear what the plans for expanding on our recreation opportunities in Horsetooth, but also in the land to the west near Redstone Canyon that was purchased a couple of years back. Of course, with this spike in recreation this summer has really shined a light on the lack of work that the community has done for outdoor recreation in our open spaces. So to reiterate the question, it's, it's um, what are the plans for expanding recreation opportunities, both at Horsetooth and the land of the west of Horsetooth? Thank you, Logan, and, and I'll answer as best as I can because I'm not, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know all the details of the, um, the horse tooth expansion. I can say, I, I can say a couple of things. One is that, um, you know, recently we, uh, we were provided, and maybe it's been a couple of months now, with our 25-year uh, uh, um, uh, Department of Natural Resources Open Space Master Plan. So that's on the website, and, and I think that, you know, that would include um, Horse Tooth Reservoir, you know, our open space areas, um, you know, for, for example, Red Mountain Open Space, Eagle's Nest, et cetera. So, so that master plan is, is online, and, and that should help inform. If we go to the DNR website, I'm sure there's more specific reference to what we are, you know, what we're looking at in terms of um, Horse Tooth Reservoir, um, uh, you know, how do we in increase uh, recreational opportunities for Horse Tooth Reservoir? And then to the west there, Redstone Canyon. Again, that, I think that's where that information would be. If you can't find that information, Logan and others, that would be, please follow up with us. And, and uh, we could ask Dalen Figs, our DNR director, or our Horse Tooth folks. Um, as, as you all are aware, uh, I mean, we've been pretty overwhelmed, although we're managing it much, much better uh, in terms of um, the people wanting to get outside, people wanting to camp, use the, you know, use the reservoir. Uh, we've had issues with, you know, uh, folks parking along the, uh, you know, Centennial Drive there uh, and, and creating all kinds of safety issues. Uh, but we are in a much better place. We've opened up all the campgrounds of the, the four different lakes and, and, and boating is allowed. There are some restrictions, but that's kind of what's happening. Uh, the, the last two things I'll mention that I think are important, and this is more long-term, Larimer County is participating in a, in a regional coalition. It includes four other counties, um, Rocky Mountain National Park, um, Arapaho, Roosevelt, Pawnee, Grasslands National Forest. Um, and, and it's something called, and, you, and there is a website and you might wanna check it out, there's some pretty cool stuff there, but it's something called NOCO Places 2050, and it's .com, nococoplaces2050.com. And, and frankly, it's, um, uh, it, it, it's a, a really comprehensive review of all of these kinds of issues. As our population changes and, and grows, what are we gonna do uh, to make sure that our, our public lands are protected? And what are we gonna do to make sure that we're as inclusive as possible uh, you know, to help folks recreate and get outside, which, which I think we can all agree is, 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 is so important. So nocoplaces2050.com is a really cool site. And then the last thing I'll mention, I, I think it's relevant, and it's a bit of good news because sometimes that's hard to come by, uh, but most recently uh, we did, the, the commissioners did approve uh, the um, uh, three uh, conservation easements and a land purchase of, um, of, of land that is in relation to the Red Mountain open space. And that will further mm -hmm. help facilitate uh, protecting open space up there and the Laramie uh, foothills, um, uh, what are we calling it? Uh, um, uh, basically that overall region to, to make sure that we're allowing for wildlife migration and a variety of other things. So I think, I think we got like an $850,000 GOCO grant uh, plus um, uh, you know, what the county puts into these things. And all of that is because of our open space uh, county sales tax, which is uh, been really helpful. We have 55,000 acres or so, 56,000 acres protected in Larimer County, either by owning the land, working closely with the municipalities, um, or, you know, through our conservation easement process. And Commissioner, I just want to add that I put the link in the chat to both the page where all of our, our, our um, natural resources master plans are. So the open lands master plan, the executive summary for that plan, as well as the parks master plan. So I put that link in the chat box 
as well as the link to the No Code Places 2050. So if people want to check those out, um, those links are safe. They come from me. So um, feel free to click on those and check out those pages. Thank you, Michelle. Of course. So I don't have any questions open or any hands raised. So this is probably your good opportunity to add anything you haven't mentioned yet today, Michelle. Well, I, uh, I don't necessarily have anything to add other than, uh, um, you know, I, I presume folks want to continue this kind of um, uh, discussion and dialogue, community dialogue. I think it's really important. Uh, we, we haven't quite pinpointed uh, the date in September. Uh, typically, the Fort Collins one has been the second Saturday. And so we'll, Michelle and I will discuss that. Um, it's sounding like, uh, unless there's a major breakthrough in everything, we'll do this using this um, uh, Zoom webinar platform. So we'll continue to do these things. And I just want to continue to uh, ask, you know, that you, you engage with the county stuff and, and your input, your pushback, all of that is really important. Yes, and Commissioner, I want to thank everybody for being flexible um, and having this meeting a weekend early. Um, uh, I'm going camping next week, and so I will be off the grid when you typically um, have this meeting. So, so you made adjustments for me, and I'm, I'm appreciative of everybody's flexibility. That's, that's right. Um, and th I will enjoy camping, everybody. I am very, very much looking forward to it. <laughs> um, getting out of cell phone range for several, several days. So um, I'm pretty excited, even though I always enjoy these meetings, Commissioner. And I just wanted to remind everybody that we do post these online um, for people to view afterwards. If, if you had a neighbor or a friend or a family member who didn't get to attend today, who still maybe wants to, to see what we talked about. Um, we'll get those on our YouTube page um, probably within 24 hours. It takes a little while for Zoom to process the video and for me to get it up there. So, um, and, and you know, lastly, um, if folks know of other people that are not receiving the email specifically uh, for the purpose of informing people about these meetings, not necessarily other stuff, um, uh, Alicia Jeffers, um, our, our department, a specialist. Uh, she's the one that oversees those those communications. So she's the one that'll send out a reminder about the, these events and, and, and the links and all of that. So you may want to uh, spread the word, uh, the more the merrier, of course. And, and also, uh, you know, Michelle is, is responsible for our Larimer County monthly newsletter, The Connection, and it just came, went out. And, and generally, there's an awful lot of good information in there. There's a site on the, the county site where you can subscribe to all this stuff, including my sometimes elusive uh, accountability report, which um, uh, again, I'm hoping to get that done in the next week or so. Uh, those are other ways for you to, to engage and um, I, I wish you all well. I hope you have a great, a great weekend and let's keep on doing this you know, together. We're, we're all in this together, frankly. Yes, we are. We'll see everybody in about a month. Bye. Bye.